So um, I'm trying to do a couple of things to uh, gather today in this talk. One is to show some results from AstroSat. Uh, uh, one is from a general survey and one is from a legacy survey. And then uh, 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 introduce you to the plan, uh, uh, which is uh, going to the study phase, that is the, the next generation UV optical space telescope called INSYST. So um, uh, I'll just skim through some results and then go on to the uh, INSYST. Uh, survey one I'm talking about is the UVIT open cluster study called UOPS, and there's a large team involved here, a large number of students. Uh, some students uh, did PhD with me and some collaborators, and Anju, Kushku, Manan, Kaushar, all coming from uh, Bits Pilani uh, Pani campus, and two of them are PhD students and one uh, did a master's uh, project. Clara is from uh, Kiel University. She uh, worked uh, with us on uh, ML-related uh, membership pacification. Prashanta, uh, uh, Gajendra Pandey, Ram Sagar, and Kamishra, they did contribute to the last one. So we have published in the series nine uh, publications, and then the number of the clusters covered are these, and a little more also as part of membership. So what basically we're trying to do is to use the UV path to uh, uh, combine, like you have the main sequence stars, the red giants, et cetera, and then the white dwarf sitting here. So if you look at systems which are binaries, so, uh, and they're hot, you need the UV uh, observations to uh, deconvolve or get the flux, flux information about the hot component. So the main idea is to look for stars which are going through binary evolution, and then hidden companions, hidden hot companions. Now they can be placed, they can be anywhere. So the hot companion can be hidden anywhere. The particular thing we started off with is the blue straggler stars. The question, the, uh, uh, the question which we are trying to address was that these blue straggler stars, which are supposed to be here, not here. That is if you start, have star, star cluster, you have stars in the main sequence and they follow a standard evolutionary sequence we expect them to be there in. But we see some stars which are not following the sequence. The question is why. So one prominent feature is this extended main sequence called uh, in, seen in uh, clusters, and they call the blue straggler stars. Now, uh, the formation mechanism of blue stragglers is thought to be kind of two stars. I mean, they're actually uh, still on the main sequence. We know that they're uh, burning um, uh, um, hydrogen in their core helium. So they're on the main sequence. So it, it, it must have gained mass through somehow. So the thing over seen over here is that it's a binary system where a star gains mass out of it, and another star, and becomes you know rejuvenated and uh, uh, becomes hotter and brighter. But this rejuvenation can happen either by collision, or you know uh, spiraling in of a binary system, or just a mass transfer. But the question is: these result in different kinds of chemistry, different types of properties within the star itself. Uh, that is one aspect. So that is the main thing which we started off with. And the uh, the whole idea was that you have to have a multi wavelength approach, and then you can actually uh, get the property of the cooler star and the hot star. Uh, and the cooler star is characterizing that, and the hot star will tell you the, the status of the hot star, if it exists, will tell you what kind of a, a process it followed to reach the rejuvenation. Now, though we could characterize many of them, the 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 uh, the major outcome of the study is that if you look at this kind of a, a thing, you have two stars. When one evolves, become a red giant, the, the, the mass is eaten up and it becomes brighter, and this ends up as the white dwarf. So general assumption was that you get up a series of white dwarfs and you have main sequence stars. They, there exists a gap in between the, the white dwarf sequence and the main sequence, a large gap in the HR diagram. But what we see is that if you look at the remnants of these post mass transfer systems, they are not white dwarfs. So they actually fill the gap between the white dwarf sequence and the main sequence. So this is the main sequence and the white dwarf sequence. All of them are sitting over here. So they have in literature, if you look at, there are different types of names. It's called sub dwarf B type stars, sub dwarf A type stars. There are uh, things called uh, low mass white dwarfs. There are things called extremely low mass white dwarfs, etc. So what happens is the evolutionary evolution of a star is accelerated or you know changed because of the mass transfer process. So one, you have a gained mass star, which has got gained mass, which ends up as a blue straggler. But the star, which has lost mass, ends up in between these two sequences. So this is the major outcome of the study. 
in the field if you 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 we have uh, uh, compared the field populations which come from sdbs sdas etc and the elm by 12s and these remnants also match so there are different kinds of classification but there are no unique classification of stars which are falling in this gap area so what this, this is the major outcome of this kind of a study and i just wanted to point out the next study which is the, the latest one which just uh, accepted recently and uh, coming from this year only so this is uh, the uh, uh, this this cluster which is actually a unique cluster in our galaxy which is called a planetary nebula so we all know that these end states of luma stars end up as planetary nebula and star clusters are there with lumas you know turn off but we don't see the still end product of any of those stars in a star cluster so the question is maybe there the time scales are so short that we can't capture them we don't have enough number of you know older star clusters to have enough planetary nebula there. So this is one of the rare cases where you have a cluster and a planetary nebula sitting there. This is a UVAT image. So this is study. The point was that whether this uh, planetary nebula was a member of this cluster or not was a question. So with the Gaia uh, uh, motion information, parallax information, etc., and estimating the uh, central star properties, we were able to say that okay, this is the actual age of the cluster. And these are the members and the other systems. But you, I bring your, uh, I mean, just uh, focus over here, where this is the evolutionary status of this particular planetary nebula. So it is still possible for the stern of star to evolve into the planetary nebula in that region. So we are strengthening and more likely that this planetary nebula is actually a member of this cluster. This is a very unique thing, too, because it tells you that if a turn of star of this is over there, what kind of a chemistry it can have and what kind of a pollution it can produce, etc. is a confirmatory thing. And uh, moving on, this is the next, uh, the, this is a legacy survey. The, um, uh, the, um, this legacy survey was sub, uh, started by uh, AstroSat, uh, I mean, uh, proposal submission from a few years back. It was one of the legacy surveys which was a lot of time, a large number of global clusters to be studied under this. So the first uh, result based on the survey itself, this much of data is already public. And the many of the images as well as the, the reduced data both are public. And we have been doing several studies, and many of them are indicated here. So we have a UVIT field of view large, HST is in between. So in very central region is only covered by HST. So we cover the uh, far UV part and the near UV, uh, far UV part from UVIT, near UV part from the HST for the core. And the outer region, we have far UV and the ground-based data and the membership. So this is membership corrected. Uh, 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 this thing. So this is published in 2000, uh, I mean, uh, 22 actually, and I'm not going into the details of this paper, but then I just want to show you the recent results which have come up, that is the uh, U, uh, the Globule 3, which is the um, Omega Sun. Omega Sun is a uh, huge, it's a, the most massive global cluster of a, uh, our um, galaxy. And the point is that it just could be a, a, a you know, a, a dwarf cerebral galaxy, nucleus of this dwarf cerebral galaxy as such. So the, the HST has seen the central part, this, um, the UVAT has seen much larger area around it. So what were studies previously carried out regarding the hot stars was only in the inner region. So we have the full region now. Now we carried out the uh, analysis and the modeling part. So this is the entire horizontal branch which is seen, which is actually not horizontal, you have a huge vertical part of it. So it is difficult to model what produces these stars as a, a part of evolution. So when you actually have to model, I mean, what in, in global clusters, you have a horizontal branch, which is the core helium burning stars. And why they have luminosity variation and temperature variation is a result of uh, uh, deviations or rather a range in uh, helium parameter or uh, mass loss in the red giant branch or metallicity or age. So these are a lot of, uh, you know, in, in, in interdependent parameters are there. So you have to literally model it to get the information out. So after modeling, we are able to fit the entire sequence using five populations, which is a combination of metallicity, helium, and age. So which basically means that there are five subpopulations within that. And this five subpopulations, we see that the, the uh, younger population of the uh, five is actually centrally concentrated. So it's basically the self-enrichment is happening there. So which would mean that the whole molecular cloud to begin with was very huge so that you could actually have generations of star formation and, 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 and chemistry um, enhancement within that over a period of time. So that may be still saying that, you know, it could still be a, 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 a 
the, the, the uh, field to do oxidological kind of thing because uh, the mass required for such thing to happen is quite high. But that's not worked out here. But we said that there are uh, five populations, and there are also things to show that the UV contributed to study that this particular faint faint upper. You expect them to go like this. This became quite fainter. So that that actually initiated the uh, uh, to, that is, that demanded the requirement for high helium abundance. So you can see that the helium content is also more. So this is more than what is known so far. So an FUV is quite sensitive to uh, helium. So that was brought the result out. The uh, the another one which which is actually right now in print is the this one. This is a core collapse globular cluster in DC three six two. It's got a kind of a dense core. The core in globular clusters you have a very dense core, and then the uh, relaxation and body dynamics play a very crucial role. And we know that the the, the they don't collapse to a central point because of binaries. And you do see clusters before core collapse and post core collapse clusters. So in core collapse, we do think that there are a lot of binary stars which are being formed, which stops the core collapse. So in this cluster, it is also known that in the blue stragglers, you can see that the main sequence is turned off here, a lot of bright stars. Now, people have uh, found two sequences in this cluster. So what a blue sequence and a red sequence. So the blue sequence of stars are thought to be formed from collisions, which happens in core collapse. And the red sequence is coming from a mass gain due to both are rejuvenated, rejuvenated due to collision, rejuvenated due to mass transfer. So the red ones are due to mass transfer, and the blue ones are due to collisions, is what is pre predicted and modeled. But when we looked at and uh, 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 deconvolved using the SEDs, we detected binary, uh, uh, binary components or hot components for the red ones, but the, the blue ones seem, uh, looked appear to be single either single or we could not detect the white dwarf. So it's kind of saying that it is still, it, it is experimentally, I mean, detection of white dwarfs is not possible for the blue one. So kind of uh, supporting it and not uh, 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 having any contradictory information from here. But this is the uh, first observational evidence for detection of white dwarfs for mass transfer uh, uh, predictions. So this is also the HR diagram where you can see that in the HR diagram also, you can see that the, the collisional Collisionally formed blue stragglers are hotter and brighter. So this tells you that the mechanisms both are working. Um, they are inner, inner, co inner side. So difficult to get the core collapse cluster, right? So difficult to get there. We are able to resolve them in far EV quite well, but in optical getting the spectra is difficult. So um, uh, moving on to, so this is the last one and we, we are working on more of these. So this is the fourth one on the series. Fifth one is, well, I mean, a few of them are coming uh, from the legacy survey output. This is led by um, Arvind and uh, 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 Ramakant from Aries and the uh, rest of the team. Members. So moving on to the uh, joint uh, mission, which is in the study phase. So this is the presentation which was shown to the first study phase meeting. So this is a, a, a collaboration between various institutions, and uh, these are national collaborators. And uh, we have a international collaborators is uh, partner partnering with CSA uh, and their Castor mission. Okay. So uh, we have a large number of astrocytes launched in seven years down, and we have actually done a lot of interesting studies. And the most important thing is, though it is having 1.5 arc second resolution. The, in the UV images are indeed quite uh, uh, very good for that resolution and able to bring out a lot more science than what we could, we could do earlier uh, with galaxies, which is about 5 to 5 arc second resolution. But what next? Um, so uh, the origin of the proposal was the, in here, right here in the, uh, for the first UV science meeting uh, in July 2017. And then um, there was a call for proposals from uh, ISRO and we submitted the proposal in April 20, uh, 2018 because we were working on kind of a, uh, uh, trying to answer the question of what's next after UVAT because we had the uh, resources here, we have the human resources developed, say, so uh, entire capacity building has happened, so we have to use make use of that capacity building for the next step. And uh, the proposal was recommended by a review committee for seed funding and the project, the, the proposal moved to a pre-project phase in March 2019. A few key things happened in there. So we had, Castor had a similar mission plan. So we had a joint Castor in Sosmaki. 
in September 2019 here, and which kind of uh, um, the, both the team realized that you could actually have a common mission and uh, uh, um, having a same um, uh, uh, design, uh, science areas had to be overlapped, etc. So that started working, and the joint mission top level optical design was finalized here. We identified our engine collaborators' roles and responsibilities. We had uh, also uh, India Canada work share document was developed in a year's time. The UV10 Beyond one day workshop was conducted in uh, ASI meeting as well uh, to engage with the community. And uh, we, heard, we also had uh, CSA, ISRO, INSYS, CASTER uh, meetings, a couple of meetings to uh, discuss the possibilities of a, a feasibility study for a joint mission. There were also reviews during the pre-project phase uh, to monitor the progress as well as to see whether the um, uh, uh, any of this uh, areas, uh, the, the technology readiness levels as well as science readiness levels of this mission are uh, as per requirement. So there are fourth review actually recommended to go to a next phase. And uh, we submitted a, a comprehensive report in June and we made a present presentation to the APEC Science Board on 28th November. The project is right now in the study phase and it, it will go on till end of this year. They will have a feasibility study and see whether uh, what, what is the actual, the, the proposal will be developed based on that. Uh, so this is a science-driven specification. So we were looking at INSYS big science questions and what are the kind of things we will require in the, uh, in the instrument, instrument suit. So we have imaging studies, which are uh, uh, basically looking at, we know what we can do with 1.5 using UVIT, but uh, a much higher resolution would be required to study, you know, the knots of this uh, star forming galaxies or the double AGN uh, cases, what we'll look at, et cetera, et cetera. So very high resolution would be actually very useful uh, with these science cases, but also we felt that it'll be interesting to get the spectroscopy. So get the spectral information of many of these things which are detected. So uh, spectroscopy of, uh, uh, spectroscopy, if you look at uh, um, uh, 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 for the same mirror size, then you will not be, the sensitivity will not be that much, but you will get the brighter, the spectroscopy of the brighter one. So you have a kind of a moderate resolution and then identify areas where it is uh, feasible. And then a lot of interesting things regarding the uh, chemodynamics of galaxies, the uh, in, in multiple population global clusters, chemical in which enrichment history of the nearby galaxies, and of course the planets and chromospheric activity of uh, uh, stars, etc. So put together, they, they, we uh, came up with a kind of a specification of a, a high resolution image with spatial resolution of about 0.2 arc second over a field of view of half a degree over a wavelength range of 150 to 550 nanometer. I'll come to the uh, uh, layout again, but this is a multi uh, simultaneous imaging uh, in, in this band and uh, wavelength coverage to be in three bands, that is UV, U and G. So this is covered in this range is covered in three bands and all three bands will image simultaneously with the spectral resolution, sorry, spatial resolution of 0.2 arc second over a field of view of 0.5 degree. We have a slitless spectroscopy for the entire uh, um, field of view and a multi-object spectrograph, UV spectrograph with an R of about 2000 and uh, HST, a field of view similar to the HST field of view, so like about two and a half arc minute field. So at the, with a sampling of about 0.2 arc second. So you can actually sample, this. if you look at an AG and the central regions of an AG, you can actually sample each and every part and find its velocity, find the emission properties, chemical enhancement, et cetera. Particularly UV is very, very sensitive to, uh, the, there are a lot of lines there, so you can actually get them and the velocity as well. And the sensitivity is uh, given here. So this is the uh, uh, specification. The most, the other important thing is you want to go back, uh, go before going, going to the, uh, the overall specification is that there is a, gap in UV, which has been there uh, for the next decade, because all the missions which were uh, planned are all the, uh, either in the ground or, uh, or from space or all in the infrared. And the JWST is already there. We have uh, other missions to go in the uh, w first, et cetera, to go. None of them is there in the UV. So people kind of thought that UV may not be required, but with the uh, new uh, things of multi requirement of multi-wavelength, as well as the demand from UV uh, uh, for the planetary uh, understanding the planets and uh, the you know energy budget and stars in the, in chromosphere etc. 
uh, it's a very, very require, uh, high requirement of uh, information that UV is required. So Astro uh, Decker, the survey of 2020 actually flagged this gap in the UV. And suddenly you would see in the last year, couple of years, a number of proposals for UV emissions, small scale emissions to be put to fill this gap. And Luar, which has actually come up with its uh, plan, it's appeared in a couple of days ago, is to look at a larger scale, like what, uh, 2040 kind of a thing. So people thought the Luar will come sometime towards the end of second half of 2030s, but that's not going to happen. It's going to be pushed to the next decade. But to fill this gap, you need to have a smaller emissions to make sure that you have information in UV in between. Right now, it's not there. So oh, I think uh, India is uh, uh, very, very uh, nicely poised and placed to actually take, make use of this opportunity because we have the capacity here, we have the know-how here, and we are ready to go. We have a plan to do something. So if it goes, then that will really fill the gap and make a very, very, very good impact because there's nothing like point to oxygen imaging in uh, UV. Nothing is available as such. So this is the high-level specifications, mission duration of five years, Samsung, Samsung synchronous orbit. You're looking at a primary mirror of one meter, one meter size. Um, this is coming from the idea that it is feasible with the expansion of the current uh, infrastructure which is available. So the time scale for you know integrating everything put together and delivering will not be too high. If you go to a larger thing, then entire entire thing has to be enhanced. The cost wise also it will become quite a bit. So it is kind of a, a thinking with respect to time scale, the risk, uh, um, um, analyzing the risk as well as the cost. So that is what it has come here. And it is able to meet the uh, the sensitivity of the LSST. So LSST will be producing a large number of transients, a large number of things. So this will be able to follow it up and give uh, corresponding complementary UV data for the um, LSST data from the ground. And this, this will be able to meet the sensitivity requirements. So these are the uh, things which I mentioned. So going to the, uh, uh, the, the, this is the optical um, uh, design, which is more or less and 90, 95% uh, frozen. This is the off-axis M1 primary it goes to M2, and then we have a, a M3 bringing it to the uh, FSM. So this is the uh, the mirror, which is very important for fine sensor mirror, which is basically fine size and guidance, which brings the um, uh, the resolution, the, the PSF stability of point to our skin. And then it is taken to various uh, imaging planes. And this is the optical design for the DMD spectrograph. So to give you a little more uh, clarity on the sky, it will be like this. So you have a kind of uh, stream of mirrors, which comes to three detector planes, G, UV, and U. So UV is split into DMD and imaging, and U gets uh, uh, U gets uh, uh, GRISM, and uh, G does not, will not have GRISM because we will use the corrector and uh, G band imager will be used for uh, guiding purposes. So it'll not, you can't have GRISM over here. We also planning to have a small um, uh, uh, high precision imaging field. So for planetary images, so this is a, a precision photometry field will also be there. And on the sky, this is the area which will be covered by the detector for imaging. So this will be simultaneous imaging in three bands. And you have a small precision photometry field and a small multi-object uh, spectroscopy field. So the will all be continuously operational. So if you place this, if you want to take the multi-object spectra, spectra of the central region of the galaxy, you can position it here, which would mean that the imaging will happen in the side, side thing. So it's like maximum utilization of time in the orbit. Um, so how will you place it? So this is kind of a, a, an area which is possible. So this is the comparison between uh, HST field, incest field, and the galaxy field. And the resolutions are expected to be like this. I'll have one more simulation here. So these are all part of the science document as well as some publications. So the multi-object spe uh, spectros uh, spectroscopy is done using DMD. It's like a uh, mirrorlet. So if you want to sample at 0.2 arc seconds, which comes to about 10, uh, 10 microns, you can't you can't handle it with uh, slits or uh, um, uh, fiber. So you have to have mirrorless of that size which can flip. So it is there in the DMD. So that is what we are using in the DMD. So DMD has each mirrorless. It can you can actually program it to flip only that part of it. So you can actually take the, those stars which are actually happening over there. So once you know the uh, coordinate cross match between the stars in the sky and the 
uh, pixels on the DMD, you can actually take them. So like multi-object spectrograph. You can also align everything on one central center line and take a one one a total spectrum also. So we we've been doing the lab testing led by Shiram. And this is the lab model, which is the uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in the optics lab. And we are planning to uh, uh, put it up on JCBT to get the sky spectra as well. This is work in progress. And some of the results from the lab spectra are already shown. This is the uh, comparison the neon source as well as solar spectrum. So we have to characterize the uh, spectrum in terms of scattering efficiency, how the slitless work, etc. And there's also a back information going on. We are developing the, uh, the backend controller only for this because right now the controller has very many functions and more, much more than what we want. So we, that will actually be much more than uh, um, required. So we are actually redesigning it so that that uh, controller is developed in-house basically. And uh, these are the science cases. There are several leads from various institutions. And uh, um, uh, yeah, so this is kind of the some uh, uh, Akhil and Shibani have completed them tech projects as part of this. And uh, this is the science poster, which was present in the last ASI meeting, covering the entire science cases and the specifications. We also have developed uh, uh, um, um, at least as a Python based image simulation and testing application because without simulations, we will not be able to predict what is expected and then work on various things. So, this is the team led by Maheshwar Gopinath, Avinash, and uh, Susmita, etc. So they've been working on developing on the algorithms. And then there are three kind, three different tools. I'm only showing one. You have a, a GUI kind of a thing. You also have a, um, a GitHub uh, Python code available. You can actually directly work on it as well. So here you can actually input your uh, uh, requirements and then it simulates the actual image. This is, these are for point sources right now. And uh, I just wanted to start with this. So this is done by Arun Roy, Abhinaz, and Gaurav Singh. Um, so this is, we wanted to see how uh, the sampling of the, uh, for the uh, multi-object spectrograph will happen. So this is the central region of the HST for, uh, um, in the F275, the W image of NGC 1861. So we fed this to this thing, and this is a simulated image for insisto. This is the kind of uh, objects you will get, and uh, you'll be able to sample them and you'll get a, a, a UV MOS, I guess, yeah. So the simulation tools are in progress and the number of objects you have to create is also uh, being developed. And parallelly, we're also looking at uh, the UV um, guide star catalog. So that's also being worked at. So several simulations and several backend science uh, um, support activities are already going on, apart from uh, technical activities. Yeah, I stop here, thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting talk. Lots of work, and I see lots of simulation part, which is also there. Instruments, simulation models, which you're showing. So that is also very important, at least on our side. We should yeah. talk. Here. Yeah. So, any questions? Yeah. Uh, so you talked about kind of special kind of uh, stars, which are not following the main sequence. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and also, I think you talked about the local environment that they are going to do. Okay. Uh, I think, I think, see, uh, uh, that whether uh, in, uh, what is the global uh, environment they are uh, working in, like uh, <laughs> filaments or something? No, the global clusters are actually halo objects, which are uh, found uh, found long back, and they are basically kind of kinematically decoupled, and they are they have their own orbits. They are all older objects, actually. They are, in the case of uh, star clusters, also what we are looking at is about one giga year old clusters or slightly close to it. So we will not have any information on the, the, the sites of formation, but these are driven by the internal dynamics. Okay. Issue. So, the blue and red is very interesting. So why do you think that uh, you said one is because of the collision? Yes. Which means the red collision. Yeah. Not single star. Yeah, yeah. It's collision means it's not even. Oh, oh it's wrong. Yeah, okay. yeah. It is. Come. It is collision. Yeah. Little direct collision and most. So other one still has some binary. Yes. Yes. 
So they That's show, the two yeah. So they previous studies actually uh, saw this separate distinct separation, and they predicted that these are likely to be coming from here, in particularly in post-core collapse clusters. But uh, we looked at these things and uh, uh, did not detect the white dwarfs in the group companions. So, yeah, so that species. means no, no. That means that the uh, the overall um, uh, overall size of the star and the temperature of the star is a bit different. So they may be lesser envelope. Or we do not know. So hydrodynamical simulations of uh, direct collisions we don't understand. So uh, they are required to model it completely. And then we have developed or yeah. My question also related to what was asked before. Uh, so you said that in the, the, for the blue objects, you don't have evidence that they are binaries or not? Yeah, binaries. we did not detect any white dwarf companion to it. That does not mean that it doesn't exist, but uh, uh, for uh, all of them, we did not have anything. But then all the red objects, most of the red objects, we have a companion. So supportive so we, evidence. Yeah. They're not resolved, so you detect no, no, one no. point. Basically, you that is what you look at. Uh, uh, SEDs. So, <laughs> the SEDs. So you get the uh, you get the spe spectral energy distribution, yeah. right? So right. if you fit the cooler part of it, you will get this particular uh, uh, flux. But your observe will be here. So you have a few more points here to give you uh, excess flux in the UV. Uh, another related question is uh, from I don't know, you said hydrodynamic simulation, but uh, uh, how many such uh, collisions are expected? Quite a bit because in core collapse clusters, what happens is you have you keep increasing the density towards the center, yeah. and then the energy basically is taken away by the binaries and the mergers, and then they take away the energy and go into a longer orbit. That is how the core collapse, uh, I mean, yes. that is what the theory says about the core collapse, right? Yeah. So the binaries form, but depending upon the, how close the binaries are, the, they merge or they actually it will come very, the, the scattering cross-section becomes so small that they eventually merge. So you have yeah. these observations for only one cluster or you have for um, many the, cluster, the, right? Some more clusters are difficult because the central density is high because core collapse clusters are a very dense core. So 362 is very difficult to handle because this is actually in front of SMC. So you have to remove all the SMC stars with prop motion and then carefully uh, take everything, etc. But this is a combination of HST and uh, this thing. So we are looking at a few more clusters to see uh, uh, how the bind and they, they, the blue stragglers are segregated because they're dynamically uh, old. So they get uh, sunk in towards the center. Thank you. Yes, sure. In your talk of uh, wavelength versus time and the various missions that you show, or you insist, the the caster and Mrs. timelines are these are old ones. Right? The old ones, so, yeah. We should we need to be slowly yeah. And that arrow meant something there. Yeah, arrow meant UV on this direction, and nothing is there because here are uh, yeah. the. the in this in this thing, it's oh. not filling. In this thing, you can all fill in some missions are there for time scales are shown, but this area nothing is there. But is there a number from Castro side now when they are starting? Uh, they have I haven't put the slides. I have the but numbers. Yeah. Slowly we can merge these yeah, yeah, sure. names in one. Sure, sure. Thirty meters from the This one. This slide? No, no, I'm just looking at the in this 30 slide? meters telescope uh, space. No, no, this is ground and space together. Oh, you I have see, yeah. LSSTs here. Oh, I see. Right. And then G is here. So all the ground and uh, oh, yeah. ground and space together. Yeah. Just the wavelength. Oh, 30 meters in space. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to know if there is any more possibility to propose proposals or it's we have to contact the PIs of those KSPs that oh, are the science cases. Yes. Um uh, right now we 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 are looking at the CSA uh, caster team as the thing, and we have not we have to uh, understand the cost share and the work share. Then only you know that how the bigger picture is in terms of science collaborations and work share, etc. So we are just going taking step one step at a time to figure it out. So 
maybe at some later stage we'll have some more clarity. Long live India and France friendship.